Hi, in this video I'm going to show you how to use CanQ in order to do um, online. This is entirely free software that you use actively online, so you have to be online to use it. It doesn't cost you anything to use it, and it's fairly easy um, to use once you have your data file set up correctly. I want you to be aware up here at the top of the website, if you just search for CanQ, be a little careful because there's also a beta version out there that's different. So you want to use this. Um, also be aware you need, it's, these are the supported browsers. It will tell you if your browser is not supported, if your browser version is too old or something like that. Okay, um, I haven't had a problem with that. But we'll go ahead, there's a reference manual there. Everything's on this one web page that you do. Um, it shows you how to cite it right here in your, when you do it. And refer to some other tools. But I'm going to go ahead and start down here where it says data input. This is where you're going to either drag and drop a uh, file or um, upload one. I usually use Excel. These other formats are available as well, but I'm going to show you how to use Excel because that's an easy thing for most people to get. And it has two types of files that you can upload um, that are in Excel format. The first tells you, is basically gives you counts of um, responses in categories and so forth. Um, but over here is the one that probably matches up most closely to the way that you would have entered data or um, downloaded it from other software. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do it. See where it says click here on that sample file? I recommend you do that and then you can just um, make changes within it. And now I'm going to show you on um, a data file that I've set up that way already. Okay, so you should see here that, um, let me just increase it here so you can see the whole thing. I don't want to have everything else showing at the same time. You should you see here that you've got a variety of tabs at the bottom. You do need to have all of those tabs as part of it. The first one is project name and never change a blue cell is what it says. Just I just put the name of my project. And then I have here um, all my sorts. These are my um, ID numbers for my persons. Okay, oops, excuse me, I've just closed that. Okay, so P1 through P32 is just ID um, numbers that I've assigned for my 32 sorts. And then these are the sorts. So the first column, column B is going to be item or statement one, statement two, and so forth with the various scores. So that's what you need to have in there right here to do use the CanQ software. This particular um, spreadsheet is mostly information, but it's not everything. You've got to have all these things correct. The next one is pattern. This one tells it how many, um, um, items or statements were allowed to be put in each of your categories and you see here this one just went from negative three to positive three I had four they were allowed to sort four items to the negative three eight to the negative two and so forth and then these rest of these cells are you just put in zero up they do not apply okay so that's the next thing you need to make sure that you include the next thing is the statements and you just copy and paste them in there. Just leave these, these columns, the blue parts as they are. Copy and paste in all your statements. The version, this basically, um, just leave it. That's just the version of the sheet that was made by the programmer. Type, type two, that means you're, it's a type two sheet. So we're going to get rid of this, get it out of the way. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go here and I'm going to open my data set okay find it and open it now the only thing i really ever have trouble with in canq is my, getting my data file done correctly if you've done it correctly you will go down scroll down and everything you see here should look correct it tells me there are 59 statements 32 participants this is a q sort design meaning they could do negative each participant could do a negative three for four statements, a negative two for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight statements, and so forth. And then the list of statements will be there and you can you can scroll through that. OK, 
okay and the cool thing you can see here shows you all the participants sorts in case you want to use that for anything an illustration anything you do okay so let's continue down now um, what's going to happen next is at the bottom you'll see that you have this start analysis button click on it and now once you've done that it'll let you scroll down a little further and it shows you the correlation matrix that will be used so just make sure it looks right I have 32 correlations and so it's got those in there okay so next we come down to factor extraction this is where you make a choice about um, centroid factors or principal components those are the two options that it gives you if you do the centroid factors you choose how many you want with principal components it will just do as many as it can okay and um, you'll see here I think it's eight that it typically does you don't tell it the number and you will see those um, factors here with the loadings for the 32 that's unrotated at this point you will see eigenvalues if that's useful to you to help decide um, how many factors and you generally you know the more participants you have the more eigenvalues are going to be large and so forth so that's not a great guideline to go right off of but sometimes this scree pot is really useful that is based on the eigenvalues and you can see here it shows you know um, based on the criteria that often some people use with with scree plots which is you have factors until you hit a point where they're in a straight line in other words maybe two factors here that's a possibility there's a variety of other guidelines to decide how many factors one but the most important thing being interpretability I'm just going to use two factors here um, but when you do that in the next step when it says factor rotation is the next um, option you tell it how many factors you want to keep for rotation okay and then hit submit and now it's going to ask you Verimax or judgmental rotation most people will be using the Verimax rotation and then you get this factor table here so what this gives you is um, participant number right here okay it's the same thing here and here really it gives you what number they are within the factor they've assigned them to so factor one person one factor one person two and so forth and it basically gives me it gives the loadings now what I'm going to need to do before I get to and um, the next step is I'm going to need to choose which individuals I really want to load on each factor and it will by default sort it so that it has those that are highest to lowest um, on factor one and then highest to lowest on factor two and you see that it's shaded white and gray we'll go through it um, here you see that the first person um, you know looking at their factor loading very clearly on factor one and I'll just go ahead and and click most of the way down here these big ones are all fairly clear until you start getting to around you know the, this cutoff um, then you've got to start making judgment calls about which factor do they load on or neither do I say this one loads on factor one or neither um, I'll say factor one but I feel like that's getting kind of small maybe I'll say that one doesn't load on either on um, either factor this one doesn't load on either factor that one doesn't load on either factor so you can make those decisions yourself by checking boxes and then you'll come down here and you'll do the same thing for to decide which ones load on factor two okay and um, you'll have to make a decision some it'll let you make a decision about bipolar factors here in a minute as well but let's say I go to about there and I say those don't load on either factor the other thing you can do is you can have it do it automatically by using which ones would have a p-value less than some amount that you choose or the majority of the common variances on that factor or all if you click all it will it will do all of them that are in the white group here as factor one and all in the gray, gray group as factor two so you can you can kind of make those decisions yourself based on your theory and your judgments the other thing you can do is you can split a bipolar factor so if we look at my factor one 
um, you can see all of the loadings are positive. But factor two, I have two of them that have large negative loadings, which would indicate that those two individuals have complete, um, their viewpoint is completely opposite um, from the rest of the group. So you can keep that as all one um, factor, or you can split it and have it just actually split for you. And I'll show you what we do there. If I split it, I want factor two that I'm going to split, OK? And now it's actually done that here for me. And you'll see I've got now three factors, factor one, factor 2a, and factor 2b. And it's, and it's done that. The other thing I can do, of course, is I can invert a factor if I want to do that for some reason, OK? All right, so, so that's some thinking and work you have to do here. But of course, you may want to come back to it because you may want you may want to try different numbers of factors. You may want to try flagging different things and see how the interpretability changes. And you can do that. Um, but for the most part, to make changes to what you've done in the steps so far, what you have to do is just reload and start over. So you need to keep your output in your notes for what you've done so far. OK, so the next thing, send table data to output. OK, and you'll see data sent to output right there. And you come down here. And what you can do now is you can select which factors you want to look at the output for. So let's put all. And we could click all three of them and just put all. And I click Submit. OK. It will allow me to download um, output any of these ways. But what I often like to do, and one of the places that CanQ is really strong, is I can look at a display of the factors. So it'll show you. I click on display the based on the the final array for that factor um, the typical Q sort right so you can look at these items in this way and start to analyze using this output right here okay you can cut and paste that table put it somewhere else if you want it and so I've got it for 2a and 2b as well so I've got my various factors there and you'll see that there's some features that it has that are great. It has a single asterisk if it's a distinguishing statement at P05. And it has two asterisks if it's a distinguishing statement here. And then it has these symbols if the z-score is higher or lower than all other factors. So that is something that's really useful as you go to try to interpret. What I'm going to find here, OK, this particular statement, you see two asterisks and the z-score thing. So that indicates right here, I mean, that's really a distinguishing item. In fact, all four of the items, the risk score of three, are, are really highly distinguishing items for this particular um, factor. And you see, same on the low end, that these two are particularly distinguishing. And so that's something you can look at where there's asterisks and so forth to help you, and those triangle things to help you um, interpret. You can also make a lot of changes to this. This display options, if you click on that, allows you to make a lot of decisions. Do you want a legend? Do you want statement numbers next to the statements? Or do you want only the statement numbers in that final display instead of the wording? You can change the cards. That's the size of the little box that puts the statement in. And that works well. Some of your statements are longer and, and they're getting cut off, something like that. That's what basically these cards and statement things allow you to do. Um, allows you to play with them so that you can um, put things in particular colors if you want to. So let's say that um, distinguishing statements, I want to have, you know, to be um, a color. This 05 means that p value 0.05, uh, let's just pick this pink, okay? Um, but it's significant at 05 and it's significant at 01. I'm going to have a stronger red, okay? And then if it's a consensus statement, okay, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll keep that blue there or I can change it. I'll make a brighter blue. Whatever I want to do, I can play with there, okay? And then once I do that, I hit update. 
come down to my factor visualizations and you'll see the color coding which can be really nice um, it helps things jump out better than just using the asterisks I can you know the darker red are distinguishing the lighter red are less distinguishing but a little bit in the blue are consensus items that's something that can be really helpful when you interpret and again you can download that in either of these formats download those um, particular things okay those displays and look at them so that's really it if I want to go back now and say I want to play with this as three factors I really just have to go um, hit um, reload up here re-upload my data and start over so you just want to make sure you save you know one particular solution and then when you try another one then then you can save that one as well and compare them